Hello everyone and welcome to Market Talks. I'm Ray, head of markets at Cointelegraph. Here we discuss the latest in what's shaping the markets with valuable insights from industry traders, influencers, and leaders. On this week's episode of Market Talks, we have Dan Rosen, Associate Director of Derivatives at Luxor Technologies, a US-based Bitcoin mining pool research hub and service provider. Dan spent 12 years as an options market maker in Chicago, and he began his deep dive into crypto in 2020 when he made the natural transition to making options on Bitcoin and Ethereum markets. Howdy, Dan. How's it going? Hey, Ray. Thanks for having me. Doing well. Thanks for coming on. Let's set a little context on the growth of mining over the past five years. So in 2018, China pretty much booted out the bulk of Bitcoin miners uh, and Bitcoin mining operations and just crypto in general. And we saw a lot of miners and hash rate migrate west. And in the following year, 2019, the early stages of the Bitcoin bull market started, if I recall correctly. And there was a halving somewhere around there. It was like April 2019. I think we had a halving, um, I think, but... Of course, I need to do yeah. the simple four I think, years I think it was, on uh, math yeah, on April, my fingers, April, right? Yeah, I think it was April 2020, right around. But the, the you're right, the bull market was kind of uh, started, say, call it summer of 2020, right after the halving. Yeah, yeah. And p- kind of prior to that halving, um, six months to a year before that, we started yeah. to see miners go public and do a ton of fundraising and ASIC prices started to rise across the board. And then fast forward through the bull market and we get FTX. Celsius, BlockFi, Terra Luna, and other um, centralized finance, DeFi, and whatever you want to call them, Ponzi exchanges, blowing up. And at the same time, we saw a lot of miners get washed out. And now we're back to square one again, right? Like time is a flat circle. So the halving is less than a year away. And there's this expectation again that Bitcoin price will rally to some new all-time high as a result of the halving. But what's different with Bitcoin miners this time around? Yeah, 100%. I love that that analogy. Time is a flat circle. It's uh, <laughs> it's pretty great. It, it is, you're <laughs> right. It, it is looking very similar to, to what it did in you know four years ago. Um, with the halving right around the corner and expected to be April of, of 2024, maybe end of the month, um, you know, the name of the game really is efficiency. And that's really what is driving miners right now. You've obviously seen that shift west, as you mentioned, from China when they banned Bitcoin mining. Um, One of the big spots for Bitcoin mining is in Texas now. And that's A, because of um, friendliness to, you know, regulatory environment and friendliness to Bitcoin, but mostly because of access to cheap energy. Um, And that's really what Bitcoin mining is all about, is that arbitrage between cheap access to energy and then the outputs in Bitcoin that you receive for submitting shares to a mining pool. Um, and, and so, you know, everything from uh, renewable energy to flared gas uh, to hydroelectric, those are all very cheap sources of um, energy, of electricity. And so you're really seeing Bitcoin miners flock to those jurisdictions where, where that cheap energy exists. In terms of like operational cost and capital cost and um, securing fixed power rates and all that sort of things, do you think that miners are better positioned this time so that they avoid a lot of the mistakes that they made in the previous cycle? Uh, Short and simple answer is yes and no. You have a a pretty uh, large curve of power costs across miners. So you have pubcos where their cost of electricity is as low as, I don't know what the number is, one to two cents per kilowatt hour. And then you have kind of retail miners who whose cost is closer to seven or eight cents per kilowatt hour. I can't remember the exact numbers, but when you're looking at break-even costs um, post-having, so when the, the block subsidy gets cut in half from six and a quarter Bitcoin per block to 3.125 Bitcoin per block, um, you're, you're looking at a break even point of somewhere around six, maybe five and a half to six cents per kilowatt hour for power costs. And that's, you know, your, your costs equal your revenues. Um, I, I do think that a number of miners, uh, po- very possibly on the retail side, have power costs that are that are higher than that five and a half to six cents per kilowatt hour. And it's going to be very difficult for them to be break even unless Bitcoin price does take off in the next um, really six months, six, seven months before the halving. Um, so really the focus has been on for Bitcoin miners to rise and to um, create or make more efficient their fleets, their, their fleets of miners. And so that's, uh, you know, a really interesting trend that we've seen the last 
few months and that I think we'll, we'll continue to see for the next several months leading into the having. I kind of wonder in, in, in this chase after efficiency and of course remaining profitable, are there ways for miners to generate revenue outside of mining? So when I went and looked at you know, Luxor's website, one of the statements there is that Luxor believes that compute power will become increasingly valuable as a commodity. And um, Luxor aims to build out traditional markets and derivatives to support what might be compute power commodities or a commodity market for com compute power. So um, what's your view on that? What do you guys mean by compute power as a commodity and how might that be beneficial to miners? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we definitely view hash rate as a commodity. Um, you know, hash rate is a commodity that miners are producing and that they are compensated for just like really any other commodity that exists in the traditional world. Um, you know, farmers growing corn, wheat, soybeans, et cetera. Um, miners uh, mining for gold or silver or um, even, um, you know, any really any commodity out there that exists, it's it very much resembles um, what hash rate looks like. And that's, you know, why we believe that hash rate is, is a commodity just like any of those other commodities out there. Break that down a little bit further. What is hash rate and how yeah. can it be commoditized? And why is there a need for hash rate derivatives? Are they for Bitcoin investors or are they more angled toward Bitcoin miners? Yeah, absolutely. So, so in traditional markets or, or traditional commodities, um, and I'm using traditional commodities as everything that we just talked about, oil, gas, uh, gold, silver, wheat, corn, soybeans, et cetera. There's, you know, you have the producer of the commodity and then they are compensated for it in, you know, on the on the open market. Um, and so all of these these traditional commodity producers, you know, use financial instruments to hedge their exposure to that uh, future potential price change in that commodity. Um, you know, if, if it's a, uh, you know, if there's there's way more wheat that was it was a great harvest and there's way more wheat that was grown that year um, compared to previous years the price of wheat will go down um, at the time that you actually deliver that wheat so it, it is beneficial for farmers for example in that situation to hedge their exposure and to sell that wheat ahead of time and hash rate and the resulting bitcoin that comes out of producing hash rate that miners are compensated for by mining pools is um, resembles very much that commodity uh, like like a wheat for example so um, in this particular situation, really these financial instruments are a way to transfer risk from one party to another. And that's really all derivatives are, is really a way to transfer risk from, in this situation, the producer of hash rate and the producer of Bitcoin in that miner to somebody willing to purchase that, that commodity off of them. Um, we do see everything in, in our hash rate derivatives markets. Typically miners are natural sellers of our hash rate derivatives because they're naturally producing this instrument or this uh, this commodity, so they're long the commodity, and then they need to hedge their exposure to changes in hash price. And just to be clear here, hash price is really the value of a certain amount of hash rate on the Bitcoin um, network and what the expected revenue per day is of that hash rate of that one peta hash, for example. Right. So previously, miners have had trouble hedging. There's not been a lot of instruments beyond just Bitcoin futures and options and CME contracts for hedging. So how do hash price yeah. or hash rate derivatives um, alter that landscape? And with Bitcoin price being at 26,000 right now, whereas two, three weeks ago, it was closer to 32. How are those markets functioning right now? Yeah, great question. Um, Yes, you have you have seen miners in the past use those more traditional forms of um, of derivatives of using options or of using Bitcoin futures or options on Bitcoin futures to hedge their exposure. But in reality, it's almost an imperfect hedge. It's only hedging one component of your revenues. So when you're producing hash rate, you're compensated in Bitcoin from um, from a mining pool. And the compensation typically has to do with a the block subsidy. These are these are the inputs to what the revenue that a miner can expect to receive. The block subsidy, transaction fees, and that is a uh, function of network difficulty. So obviously, if there are more miners on the Bitcoin network, their the expected revenue for a certain amount of hash rate decreases. So there's more competition for that same. Uh, re revenue or rewards. Um, so therefore, you know, using Bitcoin futures to s just sell futures um, or selling call options on, on Bitcoin as well 
really is an imperfect hedge to match the revenues that you're generating as a Bitcoin miner. Hash rate derivatives and, and our kind of hash price forwards allow you to match those exact revenues to a perfect hedge for what you are producing in hash rate. Um, so it, it literally lines up the revenues perfectly, which is fantastic for miners to be able to hedge the exact um, and replicate the exact um, revenue that they're creating with their hash rate. Basically meaning I can project um, what three months or six months out, what price, what sort of price volatility there might be, lock in a rate and open a call on that? Is that essentially what miners are doing? Yeah. So, so really nothing to do with options, but um, these are, we call them forwards. They're very much resembling what futures would look like or what people are used to what futures would look like. It's essentially locking in a guaranteed revenue or guaranteed price for your future production of hash rate. So for example, right now, I know you referenced this a little bit earlier, the value of one petahash on the Bitcoin network. And, th and let me back up actually just a little bit there. Luxor has this hash rate index and this hash rate index um, quantifies the value of one petahash on the Bitcoin network at any one point in time. Um, so when Bitcoin price was up at thirty thirty one thousand uh, dollars $31,000, just a, a week, week and a half ago, we were looking at a uh, USD value of right around 72 to $74 per petahash on the Bitcoin network. Since Bitcoin price dropped to right around 26,000, I think today, you're looking at instead of 72 to $74 per petahash on the Bitcoin network, and this is all quantified by Lexer's hash rate index, you're now looking at a price of right around $60 per petahash. So that, that's a pretty steep drop off. I think it's a, like close to 15% drop off in revenue that a miner can expect to receive for one petahash on the Bitcoin network. And that's a, that's a huge difference. Now you have yeah. uh, multiple ways of diversifying revenue streams and then also hedging risk because of these hash rate derivatives. So miners can now rely on renewables, they can explore immersion, they can um, co-locate, they can allocate rack space to GPUs, which might be doing AI modeling and training and all that other stuff. They can hedge with these hash price or in hash rate derivatives now. It sounds like the sector has evolved and become more dynamic. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. I think we're, what we're doing here is really porting um, all of these, these instruments and, and risk management techniques that exist in traditional finance and haven't completely exist or matured in the crypto space yet. So we're porting them over to crypto and allowing um, miners to, to hedge their, their exact revenues. Um, and, and I do strongly believe that, you know, you, you've seen miners in the past that have acted, you know, maybe the, the term is somewhat irresponsible. Um, but they, they do have a long-term view of Bitcoin and they want to hold that Bitcoin for, for a long period of time. I think you will see, start to see shareholders and boards of some of these mining companies. And this is eventually, maybe not in the next six to 12 months, but eventually you will see these shareholders and boards require their companies to be hedged, um, just like any other traditional commodity producer. You wouldn't see, for example, Exxon or, or any traditional commodity producer out there hold on to you know hundreds of thousands or millions of barrels of oil, for example, for the next two years, hoping that the price appreciates. Um, and I think, you know, if you have a, a great arbitrage on the price of energy versus the outputs and hash price as a miner, um, you've basically locked in a profit. And the way to lock that in really is with hedging um, using hash rate derivatives. Exactly. And larger miners also have the option of kind of the demand response um, where they can turn on and turn off and curtail and be paid for curtailing. So the industry is becoming more dynamic. You know, after the halving, there's probably going to be a lot of volatility in the hash rate because of um, some miners needing to shut off and figure things out. And it's just going to be all yeah. over the place, I imagine. And then it'll normalize. So I guess you could assume there will be a lot of interest then on the short side for hash rate derivatives, wouldn't there? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I think the trend, obviously, for the last eight months of this year has been steady hash rate growth on the Bitcoin network month to month all the time. And it hasn't stopped yet. And I, I don't think it will through the end of the year either. There are lots of 
uh, miners that are continuing to bring on more mines, more hash rate onto the network. Um, and I think some of the base cases by, you know, both Luxor and Galaxy and some other um, research institutions are a base case of somewhere between 430 and 470 exahash on the Bitcoin network. Um, so I think we'll continue to see that trend grow, maybe somewhere around, I don't know what the number is, another 10% to 15% by the end of the year. Um, but I think it's, uh, you, you know, you hit the nail right on the head with uh, looking forward to the halving is like we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of these miners that are not break even at eight cents or seven cents per kilowatt hour. And so while you'll continue to see that increased hash rate growth into the end of the year, I do strongly believe that at the halving or the months post halving, you will start to see some hash rate come offline as those miners become unprofitable. What's your take on the base case for Bitcoin? So with all of this evolution and the kind of Bitcoin investment infrastructure that's beginning to emerge with the diversification of revenue streams and miners now engaging more with renewables and putting their footprint, you know, basically becoming multinational companies um, as a way to just remain profitable and increase the their hash rate. Like, um, and of course, BlackRock, Fidelity, all these other entities getting into Bitcoin, the eventual, we hope, approval of an ETF, yada, yada, yada. Like it's really mainstreaming and the infrastructure is being built in this industry is maturing. So what's your just kind of gut feeling on how that impacts Bitcoin's volatility? I don't really care about the price. I'm an up only guy. I, I just see yeah. why multiple reasons why price is going to go up for an asset that's supply limited, but the price whipsaws are concerning. The high volatility is concerning. So what's your gut intuition on what we might see happen there over the coming years? If we're talking volatility, then then you're talking to the right guy, Ray. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think any maturing asset um, goes through these experiences of high volatility at first um, be before it matures and, and eventually lands on a, on a lower volatility regime, if you will. So, you know, it, it, I think you can compare Bitcoin very much in terms of volatility to those tech stocks in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s. Apple at the time or Google at the time, their volatility was astronomical. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin did touch those pretty crazy high levels of volatility um, around, you know, 70 to 100 percent back four years ago. Even now, you know, we've seen that volatility calm down or at least see these periods of much lower volatility in the, you know, 30 to 40 to 50 percent annualized basis of, of volatility. Yeah, yeah. And, That's and, a get and up I think time. you'll continue to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, but, I, but I think you'll continue to see that trend um, as as the asset class becomes more mainstream and, and investable, hopefully with, with an ETF coming at some point. I, I think you'll you'll see Bitcoin as a, you know, maybe right now it's about 40% annualized volatility is where the implied volatility is priced. Um, I, I think you'll see that as a 20% or maybe sub 20% annualized volatility asset class, which is going to be pretty wild to see. And that may not be for three, four, five years from now, but I think we will get there eventually as the asset matures. I'm yeah. starting to hear from analysts that I respect that they're worried that the impact of the upcoming having on price could be muted by what's happening in macro. If the U.S. falls into recession, if we get another uncontrollable inflation spike, if the Fed reverses course and starts easing, which basically is throwing gasoline on a fire, which we will call inflation, all these things could have some unexpected impacts on Bitcoin price. So just outline for me, what's your general view right now on macro? Yeah, yeah, super interesting. Um, I, I think it's, you know, uh, there's there's multiple answers to this question, but you, you saw a period of time where the U.S. yield curve was severely inverted, especially in 2022 and heading into 2023 with, with you know, you call it three months, 12 months, two year bills being at much higher rates than than the long end of the curve at 10 and 30 years. And over the last month, that has kind of pivoted a little bit. And we saw no change over the last month in those short term rates. And we've seen an increase of about 50 basis points in the, the long end of the curve, the 10 year and 30 year, 30 year particular. I think the market's starting to realize that we're probably not going to get down to that 2% inflation target rate anytime soon. And it does really appear that the market's starting to price in that we're going to see that longer term inflation shift 
from that 2% target to somewhere in the two and a half, three, maybe three and a half percent range. And that's where the the Fed will eventually stop. So I think you're starting to see the market price that in. In terms of um, you know the the worldwide macro view and, and looking at China and Evergrande and kind of all of those current situations, I think you're still seeing the U.S. dollar as a flight to safety asset. Yeah. Um, and, and we've yeah. seen that very obviously in Argentina most recently in the last um, several months, but also the last several years as well. Um, their peso has been severely devalued as you see a capital flight and um, talent flight out of Argentina. Um, and, and so that obviously does you know, provide some sort of macro headwinds when you put all of this together, the Fed, China, and then all of these other countries that are um, devaluing their currency and fl- um, or f- fleeing to the US dollar as a hedge. Um, and in, and you'll continue to probably see that increase in uh, the DXY value. And that obviously leads to a depreciated value of dollar denominated assets. However, I, I will kind of put um, kind of maybe a positive twist on this in that I am still optimistic about Bitcoin. I don't necessarily see or think that we'll see a $60,000 Bitcoin, so double the price or $50,000 Bitcoin by the time of the halving in April of, of this coming year of 2024. But I am optimistic in Bitcoin long term, even even if we look six months, but it, especially if we look three, four or five years out, um, you know, there there are some differences between, say, Bitcoin and gold and why I would expect Bitcoin to appreciate over the medium and long term more significantly than gold. Bitcoin is a, a technology and it does have a network effect. And we've seen that growth grow steadily over time. And I expect that to continue, that growth to continue as well. Um, even when you do see some of these macro headwinds, sure, we might not see Bitcoin at 60K by April of 2024, but I'd be pretty surprised if we do see lows again in the price of Bitcoin over the next six months from the macro headwinds. Right, right, right. Thank you for explaining that with such depth. All right. Well, that pretty much wraps it up. I want to thank you for coming on, Dan. It was a great chat. I appreciate you um, basically dropping all this alpha and explaining to us what is the future of the Bitcoin mining industry. Um, if people want to follow you and learn more about you and you know keep up with you and all your brilliant insights, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. You can find me on LinkedIn, um, active there, but also on Twitter, I am the hash price guy, uh, which is also at crypto options OG. Um, so you can find me at, at either of those, those social media sources. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Thanks for tuning in to Market Talks. I'm Ray Salmond. I'm here every Thursday. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks, Dan. Thanks so much, Ray. Enjoyed the conversation.